Hello and welcome to all those watching Argumentative Indians. I'm Shweta Kothari and we have a brilliant panel today to discuss a very important topic that's been making headlines, especially in India, should brands take a, take a stand on socio-political issues. So should brands, uh, you know, perhaps come out more strongly with what their opinion is on what's happening in the country as far as the socio-political understanding is concerned. And it has happened repeatedly in the past couple of days and weeks. Whether it's a good trend or a bad trend, uh, that of course will be discussed. Can companies with influence assert themselves onto the larger audience that that is that 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 essentially is a part of its function should they be isolated from the issues that surround us more importantly should brands only focus on business or on also perhaps on the people who are going to be uh, you know uh, uh, receiving a, a product of what they come up as a part of their business. All of that, of course, will be weaved in today. We have a brilliant panel. Let me quickly introduce the panel to you. Uh, we have Dr. Prakash Bagri, who's an Associate Dean, Corporate Engagement at Indian School of Business. We have Jesse Paul, who's founder, CEO of Paul Reiter, India's leading B2B consulting firm. We have Dr. Daniel Caution, I hope I, I pronounced that correctly, Associate Professor of Marketing at Drexel University, Libro College of Business. We have Dr. Madhu Viswanathan, who's a Senior Assistant Professor of Marketing at Indian School of Business. Thanks very much, everyone, for joining us today. Let, let's quickly deep dive into the bigger question here. Should brands be taking a socio-political stand? Is it good for business, even if it's not good for people, or whether it's good for people, but it's not good for business? Either ways, that's the trend we are seeing, Jesse. And I want to begin with you. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? So first of all, brands have always had a position, but the reasons are basically, I go where the eyeballs go. So let's keep that in mind. Uh, secondly, something I like to tell people is that brands don't actually have morals. Um, only the people behind them do. So they express a view if they're you know, stakeholders, the decision makers want to express a view, they do, otherwise they don't. And it also varies by country. And the reason, like one of the arguments is that, oh, yes, they have a very progressive view, so they express it everywhere. But you will notice that the same brand will have a different view in Saudi Arabia versus, say, India versus, say, US. So a brand that is all for women in one country will completely be fine with having segregation in Saudi Arabia and in the US will have a very different thing. And that's because brands are always tempered by what their key stakeholders want. We can debate a little let, later as to who are their key stakeholders at any point in time and how much uh, decision making power they have. And it varies depending on whether you're a private um, individual who owns this brand or whether you're owned by a bunch of shareholders who all have to agree that you have to take a stance. Um, so with that, I'm going to leave that as my opening gambit, which is brands cannot and do not have morals. Prakash, do you agree that uh, brands cannot and do not have moral and they only operate for profit? Well, I think uh, I'll come back to agreement or disagreement a bit later on, but just to put it in context to what Jesse said, uh, the fact that business and brands need to move beyond profitability is, a, is something which has been in the discussion for the better part of the last three and a half decades. Uh, Sumantra Ghoshal and Christopher Bartlett first mentioned it in their seminal paper uh, about the subject. Now, does it make sense for the brands or not is something again which has been uh, studied researched and debated for the better part of the last decade and a half because there's been a very strong association made between brand purpose and profitability so those two uh, aspects are aspects which are kind of uh, established having said that the current environment has brought this discussion into the mainstream and the reason it's brought this into the mainstream is obviously the, the, the societal issues, the woke consumerism on the one hand. Uh, the second part is we live in an information world. We live in a digital world. And I'll kind of amplify on that later on. Jesse already talked about the stakeholders and the fact that brands nowadays and businesses nowadays have a much wider cross-section of stakeholders, each of whom have become important. So this is the reason why we see this discussion becoming mainstream so much so that some commentators have said that purpose is perhaps the fifth P of marketing today. 
Having said that, it also leads to people desperately trying to acquire purpose. And the stand which I am going to take is that purpose is not, brand purpose is not a one night stand. And to that extent, a brand has reason to take purpose if it comes as an integral part of the overall brand offering. If it doesn't, then it doesn't stick. And that makes a much messy situation around. So that's what I would like to leave on to the discussion and back to you, Shweta. So Prakash, from what I understand is that it depends on whether a brand has a purpose or not. Not, not all brands are crooked, not all brands operate for profit and not all brands need to necessarily stick to a purpose. Am I, am I right in understanding? Yeah. So the role of a brand, and this is to kind of go back to what Jesse said, is not to kind of say, what do they stand for on every issue? That's not the image of a brand. At the same time, if the brand has a reasoning to take a very strong stand on a particular issue because it's part of the overall brand context, then absolutely it should take it much more firmly. But brands cannot be like, like a politician changing color every day, depending upon uh, which side the sun rose that particular day. It is a much more long-term context, which we have to keep in mind. Okay. Uh, Daniel, I want to come to you at this point in time, uh, because there have been brands uh, who have supported both uh, uh, Democratic and Republican parties on both sides. So there have been brands who have heavily invested in, in both the parties in the US. And, uh, you know, they, they have for a very long time, and I think we saw this trend, and if I'm not wrong, I, we saw this trend up until 2009, 2010, where Brands perhaps were wary of making a very strong political stand. You can correct me on, on the year there. But I, I want to know from you, what has led to this trend? Why are brands today perhaps uh, more ferociously taking a stand? And do you see this sustainable going forward? Because ultimately, the, the business is the reason why brands exist. So if the business goes, so does the brand value. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad that you asked that to begin with, because that's one, one thing that I um, have thought quite a bit about. I've been studying this probably since around maybe 2014, 2015, I've been looking at this. And when I began these, my studies, uh, mostly I was trying to convince people that this was possible, that brands could be taking stands like this. And then gradually over time, I've been noticing more and more people are thinking, okay, I, I'm, I'm committed as a brand to do this, but I just don't know how or when. Or So it's, it's worth going back to see what the big trends are. And uh, the, the way that I see the big trends, the driving forces behind this uh, is one is that consumer and employee uh, desires and preferences, what they're looking for in companies has changed a lot. Their expectations that companies and brands behave morally, or at least think about their morals, has been like ratcheting up really quickly uh, over the past 30, 40 years, I think. It's, it's, been be it's much more a conscious part of the way people consume and even the way people look for jobs and sometimes more and more the way that uh, the reasons behind why people invest in one company versus another company. So stakeholders are caring and they're looking more closely at what companies are doing. On the other hand, we also have this really a global trend, but I think because in the United States, as you mentioned, we have, there are a two, basically a two party system. It's probably the most evident here uh, that we have this polarization of people all over the world. So we have, you know, people are becoming more extreme uh, on the right, People on the more conservative side are becoming more extreme. People on the left, the more liberal people are becoming more extreme as a whole. And as they're separating, the middle is kind of dropping out. There are fewer and fewer people in the middle. And so what companies are seeing is that, you know, there, there's an, an extreme pressure now to try to, to figure out, you know, how am I going to respond to my stakeholders? Uh, and that middle area, that neutral area is starting to disappear a little bit more and more, and they're being forced to take one side or another. Uh, so this to me, because these are such long-term trends and they're such, uh, they're such pervasive trends globally, I, don't, I just don't see any escape for companies. I, I don't think that in the future there's any way to say, I'm just going to avoid the political si situation and just be, try to be neutral on every topic. Um, so what I, what I tell uh, both practitioners and, and scholars, I think is very analogous to what uh, Prakash was saying, which is uh, as a brand, every brand should expect to get involved in politics to some degree, whether willingly or unwillingly. Um, but every brand should not expect to get involved in everything 
all the time uh, because that then that then things just start to get muddy and you don't fulfill those expectations that are building up uh, from consumers and other stakeholders. Right. Uh, I just wanted to ask a follow-up question before I move on to Madhu. I wanted to know from you: Is there a generational change that is driving this? Do, do you think this this is this is something that's happened recently, or has it been a part of our history where brands have always taken uh, one side or the other? As far as my memory and my you know knowledge of history goes, even during World War One, World War Two, or at a time when when uh, we had only two superpowers in the country, uh, brands whether they liked or not, were inadvertently a part of political messaging all across the world. Uh, so do you think the consciousness among brands today, uh, is it is it a, a part of a generational change? Is it something the millennials and the Gen Zs want and therefore brands are perhaps, you know, making way to the demands of their consumers? I agree with you, first of all, that, the, that there, it's impossible to completely separate government from business. And it has been going on forever. And we've even seen companies take stands in the past. In the 1980s and 90s, Benetton had some very provocative advertising campaigns um, in which the, you know, they made some real calls to, uh, to race and uh, politics and, and crime in Italy and in, in other countries of the world. So it's, it's been around for a while and kind of used as a tool a little bit. Um, the, the history of it is more uh, lobbying and behind the scenes. Um, and now I think because of this pressure from partly the new, this, the younger generation or the more, you know, the more recent generations, um, there's more pressure to bring this stuff out in the open. And I, I think that's a good development. I think it's a positive development to take a lot of the things that were going on in the, in the background and people were a bit hush hush about, uh, and bringing that more and saying, okay, if you, if you really believe in this, then say it out loud and let's hash it out, uh, as a group of stakeholders and decide whether we want to continue with the company or not. Madhul, I want to come to you at this point and, and, and I want to know from you, what's the problem with a brand coming up with an advertisement where two women are literally celebrating Karva Chauth? Uh, we, we are living in a time where there is a demand for uh, making, uh, you know, perhaps for brands to be more inclusive. And that's what the Gen Zs want to see brands doing. But then there is backlash. And then inadvertently, we know brands are made to pull down those advertisements due to various reasons. So do you see this trend continuing? Uh, I want to know, one, that will, 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 will you, do you think that this will happen time and again, because this is something that the people are asking for? And secondly, is, is this a deliberate tactic? Because to many, it could be a way of making the news for some time, getting your uh, brand, uh, you know, the necessary spotlight, and then eventually pulling it down. Um. Okay, so let's start on a few things. Like, you know, some of the things I wanted to say was actually echoed by Daniel in the sense that, you know, a lot of what we're seeing is a reflection of the customer base we have, uh, the kind of environment we're growing up in. And it's, it's a good thing for me. And, you know, I always believe that brands are made up of individuals. They've had this purpose and activism that Prakash is calling out. No, we will talk about that. I, I don't know what the difference between a purpose and an activism would be. Maybe there are some differences there, but it's, it's open to question. Um, the other thing, going back to what you were talking about, right, is, uh, you know, in some ways, controversy always works. Right? Politicians know it. That's why they touch on controversial topics. And in today's world, almost anything can be a controversy. And so I don't think brands plan on controversies. They probably want to go as close to a controversy as possible and then try to get the better of it. Uh, but it does work. And, you know, there are brands who do touch on controversial topics, knowing it's controversial and get the better of it. Okay? And a lot of those factors are driven by knowing their stakeholders well, understanding the kind of controversy they're going to generate, so, you know, it, it is planned, right? So Nike, for example, or even Under Armour, right? When they pick up their sports person and not sponsoring certain things, they, they are picking up on those controversies. The issues are unplanned controversies, right? Things which you're not thinking would be a controversy and then it erupts, right? Um, and so on that sense, yes, right? So there is planned controversy and unplanned controversies. And so brands do try to go with planned controversies. 
going back to the next question that you had right in the sense is this going to be the norm i think definitely and i think brands are going to get much better at you know doing these things because a lot of it is understanding the new generation and understanding topics that can you know ignite in a way that is not planned now there is always the danger of things going viral and not being planned but i'm sure there's going to be a whole huge pr handbook that's being going to be handed out to everybody saying this is the process you follow when things go out of hand but this is to stay i i don't see this changing from now on we we expect our brands to signal who they are and you know have a discussion about it and agree that this is the value proposition they are offering and you know if it's transactional it's transactional if it's more loyalty driven it's going to be that Shweta, you're on mute. Yes, yes. Right. I, I'm I the first, first one to, to say disagree. That. Can I be the first to disagree? Absolutely, please. I was just about to come to you. Um, you know, uh, interesting point about do brands actually plan a controversy, or it just so happens, um, it, you know, inadvertently that that uh, an advertisement becomes controversial. Uh, I think that that's an interesting uh, point there. Perhaps just if you could come in and tell us, do you think this is deliberate, or do you think just just so happens that brands right. Landed um, controversies. So, an unplanned controversy is actually a marketing disaster, and you just have to say the marketing team screwed up. There's no other way to explain that, right? Um, you should know your context better. You should have known your customers better. You should have known Twitter better. You should have known your influencers better. All of that good stuff. Um, having said that, like around the time of the, you know, I think when Mintra did the first. Uh, lesbian couple ad they had launched um, i think it was anoki or something 2014 i'd put together a cause matrix it's a 2 by 2 matrix and uh, the two axes is um novelty and social acceptability right now things like gay marriage are both novel as well as not very acceptable whereas something like adoption um it's still fairly novel in india but socially acceptable and when i say socially acceptable i don't mean vast majority of people will do it i just mean that vast majority of people will find it awkward to um go in a public forum and say this is a terrible thing so when you say women's equality i may or may not believe in it it may still be a novel concept for me but i would find it difficult to go to a public forum and say it is a terrible idea i might get bashed up people do but it's still not acceptable so by 2 by 2 matrix i have a list of causes and if you follow that so if you go to the top left corner which is highly novel and highly unacceptable to the public you are going to get your shops burned down if you go to the right extreme where it is novel and socially acceptable your ad is going to go viral people are going to be oh such a progressive company so sweet of them to talk about this aspect and so on so now that there is a very simple framework and you know as i pointed out earlier i'm the only person in this panel without a phd now if i can come up with a 2 by 2 matrix any brand marketer can do the same and be reasonably good in understanding his audience and saying is you know something that looks like a lesbian couple uh you know along with hindu religion combo is this going to be something that gets your shops burned or is it going to go viral i think the answer was pretty obvious now if you see the latest tanishk ad it pretty much uses all the stuff from a right quadrant it's got mental health it's got adoption it's got man making more than woman all wonderful novel concepts that however are reasonably socially acceptable at least at face value so the shops are not going to get burned so yeah to answer your question very simple framework exists if you stumble upon a disaster it is because you were essentially tone deaf and i'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing that consumers or activists are able to get your shop burned but if you were okay with it that was fine but if you just happen to let it happen that was your fault so just to add i i think this is the framework is good uh, but you know my my issue with it is socially acceptable is is a very broad category right 
who are we trying to please in this socially acceptable and of course it varies by who you are as a brand also right some brands are you know an under armor or a nike is going to say this is who i am this is my brand i am about changing the status quo right and if the goal is to essentially have a successful ad sure you know you can be along those lines of socially acceptable and novel ideas but if it is about saying okay you know this is me as a brand and i want to you know raise these issues okay i i think that would be a very different way of looking at things so the way i see it and and where i disagree i i, I love the 2 by 2 construct but i think brand purpose cannot be seen as a marketing campaign issue to be decided by the cmo and i think that's where it gets completely screwed up so to just take uh, jesse's titan analogy it all works fine till given the situation you land up with this uh hindu girl in a muslim household and all hell breaks breaks loose and 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 the company finally withdraws the ad even though they it's 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 been part of their dna for the better part of two decades to come up with edgy social movements etc it moves it why because it's still not that purpose is not integrated with a brand it's been seen primarily as a campaign element and i think this is the one area which we have to realize uh coming back to the point which daniel said uh the reason i object to brands taking a political stand is because a brand has no role in politics what has on the other end happened is that our society has become polarized so every issue either has a for and against these are be the political stand and therefore we are expecting brands to take a political stand i don't think brands need to take a political stand at the same time brands need to stand for causes but a brand which basically adopts a cause because it's a great campaign is bound to have mud on its face some stage or the other now now look at the example of nike we talk about nike taking a cause and yes it it basically supported colin uh, because it stood for what the brand is nike didn't take a cause when uh, uh, tiger woods went through his adultery issues because nike completely seriously believed that it had no reason to pass a commentary on that subject that had nothing to do with nike as a brand it stood for human achievement and and therefore it's important for brands to recognize what do they stand for bring it activate it make it a part of the dna and sure then stand on the rooftops and talk about it but you cannot just be an activist for the heck of it because it makes great campaign sense for this particular campaign okay i, I want to bring in daniel at this point in time and maybe also uh, weave in nike's example you know what happens daniel essentially in india and, and i hopefully you can give us some global context on this is then uh, is when uh, an ad goes wrong uh, we see the repercussions out on streets in in the public outlets of of that brand uh, we see an anger that flares up on twitter that essentially means that there's going to be um, a physical uh, uh, you know manifestation of it on the brand store does that happen in the us has it happened in the us and if it does are brands likely to cover under pressure because in india they have and and i don't know if if everybody on the panel will agree but i think they have covered in, under the pressure of of you know public disagreement of certain fringe elements telling them that we are going to burn your shops down that we are going to harm your employees what do brands do in that case do they take a do they do they stay firm on their stance or do they roll back their purpose their advertisement so much money planning that went into it and and hopefully some some sort of purpose also that went to it went, went into it right so it, it wasn't just a loan advertisement that there must have been a lot behind it so i want to know from you what is what is it that the us companies are likely to do and what's the best uh, yeah. best foot forward that a company should be taking in such a case scenario these are so far much more extreme examples of of reactions than we've had in the states i mean in the us we've we have uh you know the worst that it's gotten is people burning their shoes on social media which is a far cry from you know actual violence against the um against the company or a shop 
So um, we just we haven't had those sort of violent reactions. We've had some, you know, in, individual people that you know would make a stink or you know would 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 come and, and maybe threaten things, but it hasn't really gone to that level. Um, if I'm thinking off the top of my head, I can't think of any examples yet where it's gone to that level. But it could, uh, but so far it's been relatively tame compared to to India. Um, one one thing that I I wanted to bring up, I think, is that. It is why people care about this stuff in the first place. If we think about consumers, what is it that they're really looking for? I, you know, the the emphasis is usually on whether people agree or not with a company's stand. And one of the the, the insights that I, I think comes out of some of my research is that um, the sometimes we exaggerate the importance of people agreeing with the stand. What people are often looking for is they're trying to build a relationship with a brand and they're looking for clues that they can trust that company. Now, if, if a company is open and, and consistent about the way that they talk about their morals, then people are more willing to trust them, even if they might disagree with them. In the same way that we're having a discussion here, we don't all agree with one another, but we, I think, you know, I, I, I can say, speak for myself, I respect everyone's opinions here, and I see a lot of value in the way other people are, are speaking because we're being open about it. Um, and most people will say they have friends that are, you know, more conservative than them or more liberal than them, and they're okay with that because they're open. It's when brands are viewed as trying to either manipulate or trying to push their values on people that these responses often happen. Um, so in the cases that you mentioned in India, that does seem like something where, you know, there's a there's an adverse reaction to the stand itself. But very often, most of the time, at least in the United States, what I'm seeing is uh, people who are using this as a window into what's making the brand or the company tick. And then they're saying, OK, if Nike does that and now I get it, if and I get a, um, a a pair of defective shoes, let's say, right? Then I, as a consumer, say, well, have they been honest with me about what their position is on civil rights or ra racial injustice? Um, and if I get the sense that they're being honest with me, then I'm more likely to be able to build that relationship. So it's it's um I think it goes deeper. We 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 have to see beyond just um, let's try to line up what what we're saying with what consumers want or with what employees want or what they like, you know, with, with people's tastes and, and what they like. It's really, it's, um, we have to view it more in terms of this relationship that companies build with individual people. Can I, right. can uh, I also toss in a framework yes. here? Um, yes, yes, please. Two points, actually. One is that um, you cannot actually have violence against a brand unless the state either directly or indirectly is inactive for whatever reason, right? So that is specific to a country as to what would move, you know, people A to, you know, come out and do this, but also what is the consequence for doing it, right? So the US has had instances of looting during, you know, Black Lives Matters protests, etc. But, you know, Daniel's absolutely right. They don't do it just because a brand said something. So that is actually a government machinery question that, and we know, you know, how it works. So, you know, for Prakash's point on why is putting, you know, Muslim girl marrying Hindu boy, why is it a problem? That's your social political context is not just a social context. Second, as to whether, why should a brand do this? Um, so I have a theory that, look, some brands are based on core, which is the functional benefits that they deliver to a particular customer, right? Um, so, there could be a gold brand which says, look, I'm the purest, you can measure me, I'm 99.99% pure, and I have the largest, you know, set of retail outlets, so please buy my gold. Um, and then you have surround where you say that, look, everybody is 99.99% um, pure, so you would buy my jewelry because, you know, I have traditions from 300 years ago, I have a design book that was used by the Maharajas of India, some story I tell you. Now, the final necklace looks exactly the same, but you are buying it because I have this heritage and, you know, the Maharaja of Mysore used to use my services and so on and so forth. Now, if I am that kind of a brand, the surround kind of a brand, I cannot avoid taking a stance on certain things. So if I have decided that tradition is my bio, then my position is always around tradition. And um, there was this, issue some time ago about the dowry trunk show by Krishnaya Chetty. 
which does pride itself on its 200 year old heritage and that's why it sells gold now you will invariably kind of head down the path of tradition and say oh but what's the problem you know dowry is okay i meant it in a different way but that's because your brand is entirely around storytelling and not on the functional benefit of the product so if i was a water brand and i talked about purity it's okay but if i was a water brand and i had to talk about the pristine mountain sides from which my water came and is collected at moonlight by these people wearing silver gloves whatever whatever then i would definitely like to talk um, at some point i would be asked about my eco friendly credentials and i would talk about it so the reason that a lot of brands end up having to tell a story is that functionally i'm not particularly different from anyone else so benetton outfits are yeah they just outfits like anybody else but you bought it because it stood for some values that you connected with and therefore you were okay with that so my argument is that if you're a surround brand sooner or later you're going to have to tell a story that you know might be a little more edgy because all the normal storytelling spaces have been taken so you start to wander around the um, you know man bites dog territory as i would say and your chances of then ending up in a area which is politically also um dangerous becomes higher for you so you might think i'm an eco friendly water brand what is the harm in talking a little bit about you know the ecology of the countryside or something and it sounds really innocent until you find that some activists are stopping some dam which is super important to the local regime and you know you didn't know that big picture and you went and said you know dams are a good thing or dams are a bad thing and now suddenly you know your shops are getting burned because someone else got upset unintentionally but that's where i come to you know the brand which is taking the call if it's a surround brand uh, i agree with prakash they need to define the few areas they want to play in they can't wake up on morning and say today i'm ecology tomorrow i am you know birth control it can't work that way but you need to take the big picture and understand the environment in which you play but um, and and i think it's an important question from from the perspective of someone who doesn't know whether brands have taken a a stance a stance on certain issues or whether they have been closer to a few issues or not uh, in the past i want to come to you madhu and and i want to know from you uh, uh, i think it was early in 2000 and and if my memory serves me right there was a similar advertisement of how um, and it was a holy advertisement of a detergent maker where um, a perhaps a, a a muslim and a hindu were shown playing holy together and i don't know whether the backlash was similar to what we've seen during the tanishk advertisement uh, and and that also i think brings brings into picture what prakash was saying that there cannot be violence without states interference so it's not like a stand alone activity if states not allowing it it will not happen so uh, has it got to do with the the uh, the, the you know the social political climate that we see in the country today or is it always a difficult territory to walk into if you are taking a stance on issues like you know the the religion which which continues to be uh, a hot potato in 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 the country so do you think that is that is one area where brands perhaps have to treat very carefully or is it all the areas where you you know you think you could perhaps ignite a fire that the brands would have to treat very cautiously so there are definitely some areas which are much more sensitive and polarized than others are right um so that is definitely true so you know in india religion might be one of those areas where it's very sensitive and even within religion there will be some areas again which are super conservative and super sensitive but if you if you think about what some of the people are saying right we are a very vocal society now much more vocal than what we were 20 years ago right and you know some of it is generational we are you know we have generations of people who have who you know grown up in very different circumstances uh, where it is not been about just you know getting the meal at the end of the day making sure their livelihood is met they have the freedom to think and they've been exposed to a lot of new ideas and they have platforms to communicate so we are vocal now right much more vocal than what we were and that of course leads to a lot of you know debate like what we are having here and brands have to be you know sensitive to what customers are going to say 
but to your point on you know some areas are sensitive yes but i do believe that you know there's no escaping that in some ways you can you can choose to be you know silent about it but that in itself is a signal and you know when prakash says we should not get into politics i think it's it's a it's a murky line you know most of these are socio political is religious things. harmony political and i i think that would be an important question and maybe madhu can come in and then subsequently prakash is religious harmony political is it is it a social problem or is it a political problem it, it's i i don't think religious harmony is necessarily a political issue right but anything can be a political issue like getting out to vote for example was exposed by prime minister modi in a lot of campaigns right that was one of his things that he was like you know people should get out to vote now if brands start supporting that would that be a political one or is it a social one right so so this you know these lines are not very clear to draw when you say you know you can't get into politics uh, a lot of times social issues when they become very sensitive politicians see the opportunity to make a play and they will get it so you can't just say okay this is social and not political you know it's all part of society as such right and we expect brands to do csr right we expect them to be a part of the community support the community but why do we demarcate the line and say hey you can give us the money on certain things but you can't expose ideas i think that's a very wrong opinion to take or a stance to take prakash so, i would like you to come in and and perhaps while you're answering that just just one more addition to that question is do brands today backtrack because of the a uh, fact that the broader society is not accepting of what they have to say or is it just because of the fringe elements and why why is it a country specific problem because as as i can see daniel says it doesn't happen in the us right it may not be happening globally so what makes us come out on streets what makes us torch uh, you, you know certain shops uh, what makes us beat up security guards why why do we do that as consumers or as people who consume a particular brand so i think the two points and let me take uh, both uh, one by one first of all i completely agree with jessie uh, about the fact that the issue blows out because the state machinery fails okay uh, to that extent uh, ha- are there fringe elements there are fringe elements across the globe uh, and i think we can get into a separate discussion in terms of what percentage do they form across they they do take uh, amplify their noise etc but in certain cases brands end up backtracking uh because the fringe gets a free reign having said that some brands manage to survive despite the fringe environment and that's the point which i was making these are brands which have acquired the credibility to become a commentator and the world accepts them for it okay take amul for example it's it's for decades they have passed a commentary on each and every subject uh you will sell them here people kind of breaking down the amul hoarding or going after them because amul has kept its stance and been seen as a voice of what's happening outside no, but I on the other hand they they always play safe they don't pick any controversial issue they, i mean they do they do the yes, last 24 months that they have done anything that would you know they, have any political in fact, see and and uh, and that goes back to your first point about no brand successfully picks up a controversial issue either that's a marketing disaster okay so i i love that statement which you made but uh, making a point which i want to emphasize you know standing for an issue is not a brand decision in isolation without the company standing behind it okay and uh, having said that let me come back to the point now for example religion is the second point do you want to make a commentary on religion very few brands do in us you have a brand which says yes christians need to go to church therefore we'll keep all our retail stores uh, closed on a sunday but a rare brand okay and they live on it they they follow it as a principle they lose their business for sundays they have done it for decades because that's something which they stand for i don't think brands try to make a religious commentary religious harmony is a extremely safe topic of uh, gazillion brands have kind of portrayed it across the years we still have brands celebrating christmas right from santa claus on to india today uh some of these end up taking a uh, a bit of a as as jesse said it ends up becoming a marketing campaign disaster and it's important for a brand to then recognize if this is what you stand for you will stay committed to it 
remember Wall Street went through its own ups and downs about what happened uh, to Nike initially when the social media was agog with people burning sneakers, etc. No one had predicted that Nike would see a sales uptick. That was a nice thing to happen a few weeks or months later on. So, but the fact that the company stood with it establishes the fact that I have identified this cause and this is a cause which is a part of my DNA and I'll stay with it. And that's the only point which I'm making. So don't go cause washing. Don't go purpose washing. Don't, don't acquire it as, as the new jacket I'll wear today, but I'll change it tomorrow, etc. It has to come integral to what you stand for. It has to be a part of your DNA because then you will remain committed to it. Then you will try to influence the society to actually believe that you have a role to play in it. But if you're just taking it for for uh, uh, the flavor of the month, then you're bound to kind of burn your fingers on it at some stage or the other. <laughs> so I have a cynical view on Nike's uh, campaign. <laughs> go, go ahead, Jesse. Uh, I, so I wrote about it and I researched it and I think that Nike was, as usual, perfect in its marketing. It had research which showed that its target audience and its bigger buyers and influencers would not actually mind that stance. It wasn't. I mean, Black Lives Matter was not something that their audience was going to go against. Um, so yes, it's an edgy take and a risky take, but I think they had their research in place which said that this is okay to do. Um, and I think they did the right thing from a marketing perspective. They weren't surprised and they were okay with understanding that maybe 10% of their buyers would hate it and burn their shoes. And that was okay with them. But I don't think it was, um, and it, mind you, it was not Nike directly taking a stance. It was merely hanging on to a brand endorser who had a stance. So they could always distance themselves if things really went wrong. But this was actually really good marketing. And the reason why brands do this is, I, I mean, yeah, sure, if it's really part of their cause, but I don't think Nike is, well, they say that it is to support human potential, that's fine. But until this recent moment, they didn't have a position on it. Um, but I think brands generally like to take a stance because it is the only way you're going to get free organic PR today. And if you only say what everybody else is saying, you're not going to get any bit of organic PR. If organic coverage matters to you, you are going to have to dance around the controversial spots. Good marketers like Nike know how to find those good spots. The others are stumbling around saying, oh, they did this one. Yeah, let's also try something similar and it doesn't go well for them. Uh, I, I'd like to bring Daniel into the conversation at this point in time. And uh, if organic PR is the only reason, Daniel, why brands are, are perhaps uh, indulging in advertisements which, which can have a larger repercussions on the society, my question to you is, is it right on the brand's part to perhaps you know, use their influence uh, and impose that influence on their consumers. So for example, if I'm a, a, a consumer of Nike, if I buy Nike shoes, or, or it could be any other brand for that matter, maybe I'd like to stay away from their political standpoint. Maybe I don't want to be a part of it. Maybe I don't want to be a part of what they have to say about the environment, about let's say tomorrow being vegan. And so is it right on a brand's part to perhaps influence and impose their views on their consumers? Yeah. Um, I mean, this is, um, if I think about the, the, the criticisms of taking stands, one of them is, is throwing around your market power, throwing around your weight as a marketing organization uh, and trying to, to push views on people. And the other criticism is that you should be pursuing profits and just dealing with product quality and not really worry so much about this other stuff that's political that has traditionally been outside. Um, and what I'm, you know, we started this conversation talking about is it, is it, um, should they, should they stay in or should they go for profits? And what I'm seeing so far, I think from all of us is that really the company should be responding to the stakeholders themselves. So you, you want to be sensitive to the wants and preferences of consumers and also employees and investors. Um, and increasingly, the way to be, you can't be, you can't be completely sensitive to people's needs if you don't account for their political identity. And if you, if you can't account for their, um, for their morals, 
Um, there's product quality is just not enough. That's not what people are necessarily looking for anymore. It's not the differentiator. It's not what, what people respond to. And so th this is a conversation that has to go on between brands and consumers where they're each showing, you know, they're giving signals and showing what their, what their, what their makeup is and what they're all about. Um, and that's where I think this comes in when it starts to get pushy, that's when you run into problems when, you know, when either consumers are trying to push too hard on companies or when companies are trying to push too hard on consumers, that's where you, I think people get into trouble and you get really bad reactions. So I'm not generally one that, uh, I, I would do not think it's a good idea for brands to become too pushy, but you need to take a stand sometimes to show that you really mean what what you say so for example the com consumers will often um, admire a company for taking a risky stand now why is that it's because consumers see taking that risk and, and putting something actually at risk they see that as something courageous and they see it as evidence that the company must be really they must really care what they're about what they're saying they must really believe it if they're willing to put something at risk like that um, so this is a very like dynamic discussion that's going on between brands and consumers, um, and uh, and brands are and and a lot of it comes down to uh, is the company being transparent with me? And they're looking and and the way that they look at that is they look is the company risking something? Yes, okay, so they must they must believe it. Uh, are they being consistent? Have they done this in the past, or is this the first time that they're coming out and saying something like this? Um, so it's, it's these kind of signals that, that get interpreted. But if you, if you look at a brand and they, and they start throwing around their market power, I think most consumers and uh, employees will, will become wise to that very quickly. Uh, and then you'll have a problem on your hands. Yes, but, um, you know, many brands, and, and I want to ask, I would request Jesse to come in at this point in time. Many brands would perhaps say that, look, I may not have done it in the past, but I think this is an important cause, and therefore I'm going to put my foot down and do something about it. It could be the flavor of the month, as you put it, but, um, you know, in, in which case, I want to know from you, are consumers driving the brand value, or sometimes brand value should be influencing the larger society? Uh, where does the balance lie? So like I said, brands do not have morals. So they don't wake up one morning and say, I'm going to support this cause or the other. The brand owner might have a cause that they admire or like. Um, and I would distinguish between a private company and a public company. So if I'm a private company and I wake up one morning and say, look, I am you know, very conscious of the fact that people need a four-day week and I'm okay with this cause and I'm going to let everybody do a four-day week. Plus, I'm going to hand over a Mercedes to my star performers. No problem at all, right? Because it's your brand. You take a call. You're the only decision maker. If your customers like it, good for you. But let's take somebody like, and you know, it's not impossible. So somebody like an ING says that, look, I am going to only support, you know, um, funds that are green. I am not going to fund projects that are into fossil fuel. Now, when they want to take a stance like that and, you know, really talk about the triple bottom line, they have to go to their board for approval. They have to go to their shareholders and find out if they're okay for them to take a stance. Now, they've pulled it off and that's awesome. So now they have the liberty to say, I don't invest in certain projects. I don't lend to certain things. And it's a conscious call. Now, they probably also have the data as to what amount of business impact this decision has had for them. But it's a fairly conscious decision saying, I'm going to do this and that. Now, if you look at the Tata Sons, they are, yeah, they own a lot of the Tata companies. And that gives them the leeway to say that, sure, I want to take the stance and the other. But if you also look at it, the minority shareholder hasn't actually agreed to take that stance. I don't think they've actually had a board meeting and said, look, I want to talk about, you know, interreligious harmony. And are you OK if we have a little bit of business disruption because I chose this path? So um, I think it's a little unfair to a minority shareholder if you decide that you're going to expose a particular value and you're not able to say that taking this particular value will deliver the best possible returns to the shareholder who has put money into you, because, you know, one is to say that, look, it's the right thing to do. It's a good thing to do. But if I look at it the other way, it could be a guy's pension funds that you are playing with. And that's not fair to that guy either. 
So I would say if you are a, you know, a privately owned brand, you have the choice to take a stance. You have the choice to elaborate on your stance, even at the cost of your business, that's your choice. But if you are a publicly owned company, you owe it to your shareholders to have this discussion and say, I stand for this. Are you guys okay with my closing my shops on a Sunday or whatever choice that you chose to take? Um, and if instead of doing this, they just wake up one morning and choose a campaign and run it. I think that's not just poor uh, marketing. I think it's also poor governance. If I can, if I can <laughs> key in on something that you, that you brought up before, because you brought it up twice, is yes. that brands don't have morals. And if I can take the liberty of being argumentative, even though I'm not the only Indian, <laughs> but, um, but, I, but I am argumentative, sorry. Uh, the, um, I think, well, two things. One is that, I mean, I, I see brands as being a, a sort of a value aggregator. And the way that usually we think of brands as being uh, kind of wealth aggregators where, you know, the, they're, they're kind of, the, the, all, of, all of those interactions that they're having with stakeholders are going to increase the, the wealth. But I think there is an argument to be made that they are the sort of aggregate of all the stakeholders or the morals of all the stakeholders that, that they touch. Um, that I, th I think I could argue that. One thing that I think is undeniable, and this is in, in research over the last 20 years, is that consumers and employees attribute morals to brands. There's no doubt about that. Um, so whether or not, you know, I, I think we could, we can disagree on whether, uh, brands actually can be moral, but there is not much discussion about whether consumers see them as moral entities. Um, and so we, we do have to consider that I think as part of the calculation when we're, when we're marketing. Let me kind of, uh, add in where we are kind of, maybe what I see as a missing link. Okay. One is the question of brands having mor morals or not, but is it important for consumers? Look at a brand like Apple, the world's most valuable brand. No one really assigns morals to Apple because Apple does what it says and manages to do it very, very well. So why do we get into this discussion? And typically, if you look at historically, the, the product centric world, brands have tried to stand for something and aligned causes. But today our topic basically came into the discussion, should brands take a political stand? And the point which I've been making that political stand and taking a stand for a cause are two different things. So really we step back, why has this issue even come up and why are we talking about it as a political stand and where does it arise from? And I would like to put it in the context of what Daniel, you have called out as stakeholders. Most of us have called out as one stakeholders. This is something much more than consumers. Brands end up taking a political cause primarily for that stakeholder, which becomes important for them, which is the employees. And where do employees become far more important? Employees become far more important in the knowledge economy. Employees become important in the knowledge economy because the IP of that brand resides with the employees and they can walk out. And the reality of today is that companies are facing a very high level of attrition, much, much higher in the knowledge economy part of it. So look at the companies where the pressure has really come for them to take a political stand, the Googles, the Facebooks of the world. And over there, the stand has not been taken because you and I, you know, some of us said delete Uber or delete Facebook, but the stand really came from within. The employees refused to work unless and until they took a much, much wider political cause around over there. So it's important for us, you know, and, and before we attribute this as a guidance to uh, to let's say the 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 more product centric brands of a Nike or a Unilever, etc., we have to realize which stakeholders really value the political uh, stand taken by brands. Okay, the employees do. Intel faced this huge backlash when the CEO decided to basically uh, sponsor a Democrat convention, and and he had to withdraw it 24 hours before uh, before the actual uh, event itself. Now, will that happen in a Unilever? Will that happen in Nike, etc.? Not, not really. And also because that, that virality of that employee voice is not that high in terms of what the stand, brand stands for. But imagine what happens to Facebook if 40% of its employees decide to go out in the streets saying you cannot uh, have this business around over there. 
So it's, it's important that we keep these two distinctions in terms of a political cause, a, a social cause, et cetera, and what and when does it become important for a brand? And these are considered views which are taken by companies. Obviously, as Jesse rightly called out, if it's a proprietor-led, if it's a founder-led company, he has a much higher uh, leeway to take those decisions individually. But otherwise, you have to go back at some stage or the other to the board or decide in your memorandum itself that you're a benefit corporation. But even then, it's got nothing to do about politics. It's about causes. I will go for sustainability. I'll go for environment. And, and that's the distinction which we need to keep in mind. The sustainability environment, I think some uh, two very controversial topics that come to my mind, and I'd like Daniel to come in and perhaps Madhu can also jump in at this point in time, that a lot of brands that we've seen talking about sustainability, talking about environment, are also brands that tend to pollute a lot. So although it's become very fashionable today to talk about environment, uh, how do you call out these brands? I mean, for, my, for me, the hypocrisy is at the center of, of such campaigns. And what do you do? Because, you know, it's the pliable sort of uh, the media that falls in line with what the brands are saying as a part of their larger CSR activity. And obviously to, to uh, you know, get, get be at the center stage of what's in motion and what's going to get them more audience and get more people talking about their brand. But at the end of the day, they continue to remain the worst polluters in the world. How do consumers then trust these brands? You almost sounded that. like GOP 26, but we let that pass. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the short answer to that question is, is that they don't trust them and that, that that's really what they look for. And that those, the brands that talk about CSR uh, and then, you know, sort of betray that trust uh, by uh, having, you know, some an oil spill or, you know, whatever, whatever it was, or someone realizes that they're messing around with the emissions, like uh, in the case of Volkswagen, um, they really lose a lot of trust and they get punished a lot. In fact, they'll get punished more than a company that, you know, will, will not have the same, uh, that, that will not talk as much about their, their CSR. So when the you know, companies have some control actually over what those expectations are, and when they raise those expectations and those and those expectations are then betrayed, it's it can be even worse than not having raised those expectations in the first place. So they will, you know, the, the companies that don't deliver uh, will often, uh, you know, they'll they'll end up being punished in that in that trust department. But it, it's a it's a huge problem, and consumers are very aware of this. They're evaluating this all the time. Yeah. Um, it, it's the information is not always readily readily available to make the assessments, but consumers are looking for that kind of information, and they want to, and they're trying to make those assessments. And I, I want to. I think that's a, sorry, Madhu. Uh, before, before I just, just want to add, add an important point there because Volkswagen is an is an important example. Uh, you know, I, I remember I was a reporter working for uh, CNBC at that point in time when the entire Volkswagen controversy happened, and in India there was there was supposed to be a committee that was formed to look into the emissions, to look into whether the emissions have have been, uh, uh, you know, they've, they've tried to reduce the emissions, they've tried to show that the emissions are far lower than what the actual emissions were from the Volkswagen cars. But in India specifically, and this is where I think the Indian specific example kicks in, uh, the report never came into the public domain. There was no action taken on Volkswagen. We don't know whether money was you know, where money changed hands under the table in the transport department back then. I and mean, these are part my assumptions, but nothing really happened. And Volkswagen continued to prosper as, as it was pros prospering back then. And it is at this point. Yes, Madhu. Sorry, I yeah. just wanted to say that's an example Martin. of good uh, damage control in Corpcom. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I just wanted to add to a few things, uh, you know, some of the things are clearly, you know, non-controversial things that could become, right? We were talking about religious, uh, religious harmony and everything else. And like, I know that in the US, for example, Christmas time, the holiday season, you know, there was this political correctness and going with happy holidays, as opposed to saying Merry Christmas. And that in itself became a very controversial political issue, right? And, you know, it... My point is, it's very hard to disentangle political and social causes now. Okay, and political correctness is now at a very high level. So that's one. 
the second thing and you know this i think is a good turn of events is consumers now are looking for more information and they're actually able to procure that information too right if you are seeing backlashes you're seeing more you know push back from consumers but part of that is driven by them getting access to information and i think that's a good way for the world to progress right we want people to know more and act more in the way that they think they should be going around now the volkswagen thing was was a clear case of fraud right that's i i don't think there's any uh, socio political cause or anything they they fought the books and then they hoped to get away with it and then they got caught right so that that was a clear case of fraud but on other issues i think you know we are moving to a world where you know this is going to remain and brands to me are a representation of their stakeholders and you you know and they should echo what their stakeholders want. now there was a question on you know are brands reacting to stakeholders or the other way right and i think they should be doing both in some cases they should be reacting to stakeholders and at the same time given the power and influence they have they should also be pushing the uh, envelope in certain ways right it can't be huge but you know just a little bit more nudge from saying okay here's where we are let's move in the direction that we we all agree on and i think that's that's essentially what we have to expect from our brands now Yes, but then uh, let me bring in the Darbar example, and 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 I, as a layman today, I know that there is accept accept acceptability for same sex marriage, uh, to the point where people are proactively talking. Maybe maybe I'm wrong. Jesse is going to correct me there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but at least the the millennials, the Gen Zs, are talking about it. There is, um, if if not a total acceptability in our households. there is a conversation around it right there there is an increased conversation around it uh, in our courts in our public discourse amongst people uh, and and especially the younger population so when a dabur comes up with an ad a, a, about karwa chauth which by the way is a very traditional sort of a ceremony uh, you know some people may also go so far as to say it's patriarchal uh, and then weaves it into the conversation around being same sex couples or accept acceptability towards lgbtq community in the country i don't see the reason for uh, you know the outrage that that we saw and maybe uh, jesse and prakash can explain it to me as 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 someone who doesn't understand where did dabur get it wrong I, so just to pitch in my opinion is they didn't get it wrong they want to re recast themselves and they should do more of that going forward the first backlash is always going to be there you know there's a little bit of dissonance with who dabur is right now and that's really stretching their boundaries for them but now that they are out with this they should be doing more of these so that's my opinion but prakash and daniel so so uh, jesse while you're thinking shweta so this was a panel on discussing should brands take a cause and i was invited for it okay if this were a panel on discussing carnatic music i shouldn't have had any role to play over here okay unless and until i am obviously a 24 into 7 television news panelist okay where i'll have a view on everything and i think a brand really needs to see what it is identified with okay for a brand to really take a position on some stuff and try to be very edgy if if that's what you're going for think about it comprehensively and then do it rather than just bring something out on the table uh that's my personal view around on the subject okay the topic is uh, absolutely valid but why dabur hello where were you till now maybe they are just waking up maybe they are pushing the on yeah, so if you are waking up you don't need to scream from the rooftops that i have woken up first freshen so, yourself so can i can freshen i talk this yes so, just yeah here's the thing right look um Once upon a time, I was the brand manager for Infosys, and we lived on PR. And the only way you're going to get PR is by doing unusual things. 
Now, we picked our unusual things and, um, you know, so we had the best campus or we'd be the first to win some award. We were also the first to have like a women's support network or be okay with, you know, gay couples, blah, 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 outside of India because it wasn't legal here. So we had a lot of firsts there. So that was in the good old days when you could count on media to amplify your story. Now, today, there is no chance that media is going to amplify my story. I need social media to amplify my story if I want free. Uh, publicity. Awareness is the most expensive part of your marketing plan. And if I am going to want to punch above my weight, I have no choice but to amplify my message. However, I can. If PR is not the way, I have no choice but to create a virality on social media. And this is easiest way to get it. Nobody wants to hear about dog bites man. Everybody wants to hear about man bites dog. So like I said, go back to my two by two matrix and pick one and, you know, put your money there. So Dabur itself does not need to have any major viewpoint on this. That particular brand chose this as, you know, let me first throw my first bomb, see where it hits. Oh, wow. I got so much of N2. So the brand was actually something called Femme, which frankly, I have not heard of since I think I left my college. And even then, you know, it wasn't a particularly hot brand or anything. But now I can imagine in engineering colleges and everywhere, the girls going, oh, yeah, we're using FEM. Oh, boy. Yeah. You know, this little thrill of, oh, my God, a banned product and stuff like that. I mean, for a product with almost no involvement, it does not have the wheat kind of endorsers, etc. Suddenly it has become kind of like Axe, but without spending all of that money, right? So brands go after causes only because I believe there is a benefit to them in terms of visibility, in terms of being a part of a conversation, and they cannot afford to buy this. This amount of publicity for a brand like Femme, impossible. So it is, in my view, a fairly calculated approach. I can't afford a fancy celebrity. I can't afford an ad campaign. Let me find a good cause and approach it i i think that's where it goes so just right, but uh, then why pull it down just uh, just a 30 seconds what to do i don't want my shops burned right no yeah, it's, because it's not this purpose it's not all purpose. your shops they are going go to, to the shops and ask for it yeah now i will be because remember the parents are paying the bill so we don't want to be the kind of brand that the parents are like oh my god you bought this brand we want to be the brand that is a little edgy but parents are like it's okay See, uh, the whole no thing about PR, the whole thing about PR has been very, very valid in a world where you're dealing with, again, information technology, primarily unseen, unfelt, intangible products. Okay. And yes, the whole idea of using PR to amplify what our brand stood for is something which we did in that industry. Look at Infosys. Basically, what did it do? It basically uh, uh, created arbitrage on, on human labor, just like a few other thousand companies, but it created such a big image of itself. But I, the only word of caution which I want to give over here, when you're a product-centric business, there has to be a bit of a stronger connection because finally your product is going to speak. You can create all this rah-rah-rah, but if it doesn't tie up with your product and if your product is irrelevant, then people are not going to queue up in uh, shops to basically either buy your product or they're not going to value your stock on that basis. So it's great to look at Silicon Valley and its usage of PR as as a as an integral part of the overall marketing uh, mantra book, but it, it fits in in certain places and it kind of becomes a bit of an odd fit in other places. So I would still think Dabur, uh, refigure out where you are. But, but let I, me I'd comment like on the person add. as well today, right? If all of us on this panel were agreeing with each other, we wouldn't stand out. Absolutely. They would be pretty boring. So it's yeah. the same thing that a brand has to do. I have to have a counter narrative. It's the only possible way. So right? I will have it on Carnatic music. We <laughs> do have to be careful to not, like as marketers, not to chase attention. I think it is, is a real potential danger that can happen. And so I, <laughs> and uh, we, but um, but chasing that chasing that attention, I think, can be quite dangerous, and uh, and 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 lead to you know some confusion about what the brand is, and then you ar ar arouse all those ideas of suspicion again. Um, so it's so you know I, I mean I I 
guess I don't fundamentally disagree with the approach of using PR and using some of these things as, as a potential tool sometimes, but always in the context of building the relationship with the consumers and always in the, with, you know, in the background of thinking not only the consumers, but how are the employees going to react to this? Um, they're going to see the same ads and the same social media posts. Uh, how are, how is the community that I'm working in um, going to be reacting to these kind of things? Um, so I, I, I think we just, um, I, I just like to put in that word of caution. Mother, would you like to comment on that? No, I, I think I agree with Daniel in the sense that, you know, a lot of what we are seeing, we think in terms of PR and campaign, but marketing, you know, at the end of the day is not transactional, right? Uh, branding is not a transactional item. It's, it's about, you know, who you represent and, you know, if you represent too many things and different things at different points in time, then people have a question on who you are as a brand itself. And so, you know, yes, in PR it works, but it might work in the short term, but cannot work as a strategy. So you have to always think of, you know, whatever you're doing in terms of who you are in a bigger perspective. And to me, who you are is the representation of the different stakeholders, right? Your employees, your customers, your, your shareholders, if you're a public uh, company. So all of these are essentially a representation of who you are. So, okay. is a, you know, you, you cannot take campaigns and equate that to, you know, the brand as such. Right. No, I, I think something very interesting that Jesse uh, said and you know, she said it's at the end of the day, it's all about business. It's all about money making. Do you do you agree with that, uh, Prakash? Prakash is smiling there. No, I am called a Jolawala liberal from the east, not for no reason. I don't agree to it, but that's my personal issue. I think a brand has to be there to make money, without doubt. Uh, there are different ways of making money, and uh, and the brand also has to figure out what is a sustainable way. You know, you could you could be a fly by night operator robbing the biggest bank around and still make money, but that's not that's not something which all your stakeholders are going to uh, sign up to for the long term. So brand also has to realize that it is there in order to not just make money today, but be making money on a consistent basis. And for that, the identity which it creates for itself, which basically lasts, which sticks to it, which embellishes it, is what it should stand for. They're very often in choices uh, in life, we have to make choices. What are you going to do for getting attention today versus what are you going to do in order to basically shape you up for the future? And, and a brand also has to kind of think about it in those contexts. Okay. Uh, can, I, can I give you a small uh, thing? You know, today we use Hugo Boss and nobody thinks it's a bad brand or anything like that. It does pretty well, lots of revenue, but the founder was a Nazi sympathizer and um, they made uniforms for the SS. It wasn't just a sympathy thing. It wasn't, you know, like IKEA's founder just saying, oh, I, you know, misguided youth. I went and joined up for Nazi youth. That was it. Not than that. I mean, Hugo Boss actually made uniforms. But that's all kind of been wiped clean. And uh, they don't have any causes nowadays. I think they've decided to be totally safe with it. But my point is that um, I don't agree that you cannot recover from mistakes. Um the public honestly doesn't care as much about your brand as marketers and brand owners would like to think. Um, we think, I mean, you know, even a Pepsi or a Coke, they hope that if you don't find Pepsi, you're going to actually walk to the next shop to buy Coke, but rarely will customers do that. Um, so a lot of this debate is actually in our head. The average consumer just, you know, today it is femme, tomorrow it is wheat. Um, a lot depends on flavor of the month and because it's so easy now to be the flavor of the month, marketers are also forced to kind of, you know, generate controversies because they have no choice, but because they don't have the budget to actually buy the mind share. I have to earn the mind share. I, you know, um, I, you look at TikTok, you look at Instagram, who's got the followers? the most extreme guys are the ones with the followers. So if I offer saying that, I mean, and then we're not even talking about the Kardashian kind of extreme. We're talking about simple stuff like 
if I don't finish painting this swimming pool in 30 days, I will have to give a million dollars away. But why? I mean, why do you have to give a million dollars away? It's your own stupid pool. But that's not the point. To get attention, I have to dangle this, you know, one million being given away. Somebody else is creating, you know, squid games in real life and saying $64,000. Extreme is what gets attention. And so if I look at TikTok, Instagram, it's just a replica of your general thing. The more extreme I am, the more I get. We talked about why do politicians get involved in these things? Same reason. The more to the left or the more to the right I go, I get attention from my voters. And therefore, I see a cause, I latch on to it. And if it's a brand that will get me more mileage, awesome, let me latch on to it. So in a world where it is so hard to stand out, um, brands really without the budget to buy Mindshare are going to expose a cause. Mm -hmm. And the more controversial, the better. They know that three months down the line, they can erase the past. Right. Something something very interesting you said. You said, if I don't get a Coke in this shop, I'm not going to go to the next shop to buy a Coke. I would rather hold on to a Pepsi for that matter. These are consumer durables. But when it comes to... Uh, uh, you know, maybe more expensive items that we're buying in our daily life, Jesse. And, and I want you to come in on that because I think that millennials and Gen Zs do care a lot about values uh, of a brand. They care about whether your brand is polluting, whether your brand is sustainable, whether you are, uh, you know, employing teenage boys yeah. from Vietnam to carry Absolutely. on your brand activities or whether you're, you're no. you know, sustainably moving forward. So do you think the, uh, the present generation, the generation that is likely to be the largest uh, portion of consumers going forward, do you think they care more about what the brand brings on the table other than just... Um, so so let, me, let me come back to an age-old um, maxim, right? You, the marketer's guideline is first you try to convince, then you try to confuse that fails, you try to corrupt. Okay, the three C's of communication. Now, um, you take something as simple as I want to eat healthy food that does not contain sugar. What do the marketers do? They advertise saying this is sugar-free. Why? Because it happens to have saccharin or fruit fructose or some equivalent or honey. Honey is added. It's sugar-free still. Now, even if I'm a truly concerned uh, individual and I read this, I would really have to understand that fine language to figure out that this was less healthy than, let's say, another biscuit that happened to use real sugar. Now, even though I'm a truly concerned individual, and let's say that I want to buy a less polluting car, I can completely confuse you by saying, but this car is coming from Sweden. That car had to be shipped all the way from China. Look at its carbon footprint. This one is made right here in you know, your back door. Therefore, its carbon footprint is less, even though it actually does consume a bit more petrol. On the other hand, it consumes blah, blah. I can, you know, spin you a good story. What's happened is that even if I'm a very woke consumer, I would find it really hard today to figure out which was a brand that was best on my parameters. Now, I would go online to research, but we know that online, again, is a problem. Now, I am again stuck with this thing that I have so much of data, I'm unable to figure out, I then fall for whoever had the latest cause. So if you happen to support Greenpeace, I might believe that you were the greenest of the lot simply because you supported Greenpeace. Um, so, you know, I think that the millennials or anyone heart is in the right place you right now would have to be super, super good at calculation to figure out which was a greener product. And I've tried and this, you know, I just wrote a piece on it. Tetra Pak says it is more green, but then we come back to, can you actually recycle the Tetra Pak? Because most of 70% of India's recyclable stuff is not recycled. So you spent extra money for a recyclable packet. It wasn't recycled. So what? So I would throw this fact in you and say, why don't you just buy my plastic sachet, which at least my, you know, rag picker will collect and do something. At the end of it, you're so confused. You're like, okay, okay, let me just, you know. But buy you know, if we, if we look at this, you know, compared to 20 years ago, it's like night and day. 
compared yeah. to like like how much scrutiny the brands are on, under today. So some of those the, the those three C's I haven't heard that before, but the three C's that you that you mentioned, um, I, I you know if I had to predict, I would. I would predict that those are going to be much less successful in the future than they are now. And I would imagine that they're probably less successful now than they were 20 years ago. So I think the trend is really moving in the direction of higher scrutiny, uh, more in evaluating the, uh, the attributions and the, and the motivations of brands, uh, and more in the, towards the area of trying to uncover what the moral foundation of a brand or a company is and it's done by consumers it's done by employees it's done by investors and it's done by the community at at, at large so, so daniel i hope you're right and, and i'm not taking a moral stunt i mean i agree there should be more visibility clarity as a consumer obviously you care but shweta mentioned volkswagen that's here and now they've followed all the three c's but having but, said that, I think we are moving away from the age of brands having to communicate. We live in a world where a brand which is going to talk to consumers is not going to last for long because the credibility is not going to be there. So yes, the three C's worked in the earlier era, but in a networked era, brand's job is to basically ensure that the conversations happening around them are conversations which add value to them, not just for today, but in the long term. So a brand can certainly ensure conversations, uh, but the conversations might give you a one-time transaction. For a brand to be able to create a lifelong engagement, it has to stand for something. Brands which actually are very clear about what they stand for, like an Apple, and I don't go to Apple because of its moral stand, I go to Apple because of the great user experience I get. So when a brand is like that, it can stay away from what's happening around it. But when as a brand, you are living in today's world where the differentiation is limited, commoditization is high, it helps for you to basically align yourself with things which consumers uh, believe in. And yes, the younger generation today does want to improve lives. It does want to understand that they are in a world which is not going to become more and more harmful, uh, what we have left uh, leaving for them. And they would love to be in a position where they make a difference. And if a brand can actually seriously suggest to them that it also stands for those things, there is going to be some positive movement for that brand. You know, uh, going back to Jesse's point about confusing the, the con consumers at large, and, and I do partly agree that it's possible to consume, confuse some consumers to some extent, but not all some consumers always. You mm -hmm. cannot do that and you cannot Absolutely. carry on doing that for, for a very long time, uh, especially going back to the Volkswagen case. There may not have been an action on Volkswagen in India, but they were made to pay for their corrupt actions abroad. They were made to pull back their cars. They were punished for it. Their brand value saw a no, hit. No, no, no. Oh, wait, hang on, hang on. They were punished because they did something illegal, right? Yeah. Not in the court of consumer opinion. So they were punished because they were, what they did was not just misguided or confusing. It was plain illegal. Um, and therefore they were punished by the government. My point is the average consumer didn't just stop buying Volkswagen because of this episode. No, brands do it correct. Was. It was just... quite a hit on Volkswagen. Yeah, it was. Soon after the controversy. They moved on. I mean, there, there, there was maybe not so much in India, and and I, I, I do agree with Jesse there. Maybe not so much in India. Maybe because we were not that conscious about environment. Maybe Indians didn't really buy Volkswagen cars for the fact that they do not, um, uh, they do not have the same emissions as other cars. But they, their brand value did take a hit abroad, and so. I, 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 I do believe, and this is, again, I'm not a speaker here, but I personally do believe that you cannot fool everyone always. And, and there will come a point where, despite of all the information that is around us, who to believe, who not to believe, whether to buy that Tetra Pak, whether to buy that Coke bottle, whether uh, the, the bottle per se is a single use plastic, what to do, what not to do in, in the age and era of excessive information, uh, there will come a point where consumers are going to hold brands more responsible. So brands can make yeah. errors. And, and Jesse, not just about Volkswagen, she talked about Hugo Boss. Remember, IBM's biggest uh, customer during those days was the Nazi government too. 
So the whole of the corporate world, the biggest players survived because of the Nazi business. That doesn't mean that we'll still align all these brands because they were part of the Nazi business. They moved along. And brands, just like humans, are also allowed to redeem themselves and correct themselves. So if a brand has indeed made an error, uh, and, and like, uh, you know, uh, you, you can go open and say, yes, I made an error, or you take corrective action. Look at Unilever. Over a period of time, yes, it, they, they really struggled to decide what to do with Fair and Lovely, but finally they bit the bullet. bullet. And at the same time, they had started investing in Dove uh, over a period of uh, a decade and a half now. So brands do realize we live in a socially changing environment, and there are certain things which you might have done in the past. Indra New is a standard uh, example of that. She moved Pepsi from the colored carbonated water into basically more health drinks. And you'll see more and more brands kind of trying to make that transition. They may not be able to do it overnight, but this is a reality where these causes will, will appeal to people. And so to that extent, brands but That's not a cause, along. right? I think what we're talking about is a cause, not like healthy eating consumers wanted. Of course, the brand is going to shift. But that's not a cause like, oh, yes, I want to propose. And that's why I think brands have no reason to just, you know, go cause wrapping on a daily basis. They have to stick with what they can sustain and what they can identify with in the long term. Okay. Okay. I think with that, we're going to end this debate. Uh, and I want to... Uh, maybe shoot a last question and, and that is about the moral responsibility of the brands. <laughs> we agree and some of us may partly agree or firmly believe that brands only exist to make business. Business is the end goal of a brand. Where does the moral responsibility lie when you have a fair share of uh, people who are buying you on a daily basis, who are influenced by what you have to see say on TV, how you sell yourself, you're a part of their life and therefore is there a moral responsibility towards your consumers when it comes to taking a stand on some very important issues? Uh, Jesse, if I can go with you or Prakash, whoever likes to come in first. Yes, Jesse. Okay. Yeah. Do brands have a moral responsibility? Um, I think moral depends on the owner's choice. They definitely have to comply with all regulations. Bear in mind that India did the right thing, like CSR, companies adhere to it, but it's regulated, therefore they do it. Um, women board members, yeah, they could have done it anytime. They only did it when it was mandated. Uh, environmental guidelines, again, now that ESG has been mandated, of course, companies will do it. So I think you will always have to regulate the things that you really want brands to do. Other than that, they will, of course, bend to public opinion, but public opinion cannot always agree on what is moral or not moral. That's where our current challenge is. So somebody might say that, you know, the stance that the FEM ad took is actually immoral. So the brand did what it thought was progressive, but in the court of public opinion, it's like, oh my God, they took a religious festival and they did this with it. It's immoral what they have said. It's against my tenets, blah, blah, blah. So simple answer, if you want companies to do the right thing, get your regulations in place, one. Second, your consumers have to mobilize and say that, yeah, this is, you have to do this, otherwise I'm not going to buy you. The only two levers that a brand truly cares about. Mm -hmm. I have so, a bit different different perspective on this. Um, I mean, I, I think the brand is made up of people. People are, you can't separate morals from people. Um, and whether it's consumers, employees, or others, morals are always part of the equation. Even if you believe that a company is really beholden, really in the final analysis only to shareholders, which I happen to disagree with, but even if you do believe that, shareholders themselves have morals. Um, so there's no way to take morals out of the equation, in my view. Um, it's it's always Your there. Your morals always might there. be different from my morals is a problem. So if I'm in a country right. which says that women have to be segregated from men, I might be acting in a truly moral way in my country, but I might be a global brand which then has to answer to a different set of morals. Yeah, just because yeah. it's difficult doesn't mean it's not there. Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah. I think the point really is, do brands need to take morals or not? Uh, maybe they need to do, but before that, I think uh, let's, let's just 
address do brands only stand for making profit no okay uh, we don't cover a huge part of this branding across the board in each and every instance of including governance itself uh, i think there's a much bigger value which we associate to a brand which is to create value and the value can be manifested in multiple different ways profit is one part of it but at the same time as daniel said yes do brands have to take a stand they have to but they don't need to take a stand on everything and my only point around over there is brands will do well for themselves as well as the larger ecosystem they operate in if they stand for something which is it integral to them which they can identify with which they can do consistently consistently and which they are in a position to push the envelope on not only does it help the brand itself it helps the overall ecosystem where it is operating okay madhu i think we can finish with you and maybe maybe you can come in and and give us a conclusion to this debate do brands uh, bend into the public opinion should they bend into the public opinion and something that jesse interestingly uh, you know brought to fore is whether there is a need for regulation on branding advertisements that can actually be a sort of a guidance document on what you can do and cannot do and whether that is going to tamper with the freedom of speech and expression for brands so uh, you know i i do agree with jesse on a lot of points in the sense that you know should there be regulations and everything else yes i think they should definitely be regulations brands are responding to incentives which may not be aligned with what a society needs they are responding to stakeholders they are responding to you know their consumers and so in a sense they are not responding necessarily to what society needs. and so to jesse's points on regulations i'm a strong proponent of you know regulations and affirmative actions for firms that's it to brands have to take a stand i think they don't have a choice i think they've always taken a stand now they're just being vocal about it will they be a, will they will they take stands on controversial issues yes that's the me that's the way you can survive in today's world but should everybody take a stand on all the controversial issues that's definitely not going to happen uh you know some people are good at this some people are not and you should just realize as a brand who you are and this going back to what prakash says right you need to say this is who i am and you need to do it consistently and pick the topics that are more consistent with your position and your stance right and i think with that we have come to the end of this debate some very interesting points relayed by all the panelists um, just to sum it up very very broadly not going to the details of what was spoken today do brands need to take a stand yes do brands need to take a stand always no should brands think of what aligns with their interests their larger goal their larger purpose that needs to be done consistently and only then will there will be accept- acceptability perhaps also towards issues that that are that are more likely to uh, that that are more likely to divide people uh, and and social political advertisement is is a difficult uh, stance uh, to take in india is a difficult uh, sort of uh, a difficult way for brands in india if if you brands need to sustain they need to understand what their consumers can take what their consumers are ready to take at this point in time and i think with that i'm going to sum up this debate thanks very much all of you for joining us today for your valuable time for uh, for the 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 on flow of all that information all that marketing uh, ideas and 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 i think for delving deeper into the the global uh, sort of scenario that exists for brands and what's happening particularly in india at this point in time thank you so much thank you thank you thank, thank you. you very much thanks thanks everyone